And now I want to pass it over to Cool, who's going to give us some. Uh, yeah. Oh, a break. That's right. Okay, now it's time for a break. So we're going to reconvene in 15 minutes. Actually, yeah. Uh, we have five more minutes. Do you want to take maybe a couple of live questions? Uh, sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so there is one uh, uh, an answer from the Q&A, which uh, maybe you or someone can uh, address. How does AMRX deal with mesh on a sphere? For example, the earth. So. Um, I think it has very good coordinate system to support. Do you know? Uh, we do have support for spherical coordinates. There's also some support for mapped coordinates. Mm. Um, I don't know, which end do you have anything to add to that? Um, I'm not exactly sure about the, the question. Is it going to, so what kind of mesh do you have? The people have different, uh, you know, same different strategies. They might have a uh, so-called like mm. box sphere or or it's maybe it's just a simple spherical coordinate. So it depends on what kind of mesh you have. It yes, is, so, so uh, it, Wei Chen showed some support for the mapped grids in his portion of the talk. And in principle, that could be used to do something um, like the mapped multi-block approach to particle or, or to stuff happening on, on a sphere. Um, I don't think there's actually any example of an AMRX code that is doing that right now, but That's there right. is some right. infrastructure yeah. for that. Because a lot of uh, things uh, what depend on uh, applications or algorithm, right? Probably. I think Alfred's still online. Maybe he can clarify. See there? Uh, yeah, for example, if you want to do a climate simula simulation, uh, what kind of grid will you use for climate? simulation. So maybe I'll take this one. Sure, sure. Okay, so there are not currently any AMRX based climate simulations. The capability is there. It's something that we've talked about. So, so for example, Earth is a regional model. So it's just a map um, rectangular domain. But as Andrew said, if you, you don't really want to do spherical coordinates for that. But if you want to do like a cube sphere, you could do that in AMRX. The mapping factors that you would need in the equations will come in in the application code. AMREX will support that, but you would have to, you write your own equations in some sense, and those would have the, the factors in them. As long as it's structured, you can use AMREX for it. Does that make sense? But it's not, uh, it's yes, not thank you. Yeah, it's not something we've done at this point, but it's very doable, is the answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, anyone else wants to uh, ask a question, feel free to please unmute and ask. We have a couple of minutes, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is one more question that, that, might, that, has, that is kind of a broad one. So uh, from the Q&A doc, how should we compare EMRX performance on CPU and GPU? Usually the capability of calculation of CPU, GPU are different, right? I think that's a general uh, problem when comparing performance between CPUs and GPUs. But the next part is more interesting, which is, and does AMRX have tools to do the profile to analyze my CFD code? And, and I, the answer is yes. Um, AMRX does have its native uh, profiler where it gives you a breakdown of um, what each routine um, you, uh, how much time each routine is taking, and you can uh, kind of uh, indicate in your code what routine or what part of your code you want profile, and it will give you a timestamp, not a timestamp, but like a, a time distribution of how much time was spent on that. This is a bit more tricky for GPUs because of asynchronous uh, computations, but, but this kind of capability does exist. You can obviously use like other profilers, like say you are running on uh, NVIDIA GPUs, you can use the Insight uh, suite to still profile um, AMRX uh, based codes. So both kinds of capabilities exist, the native one, and then you can also uh, kind of, it filters down to Insight tools too. Did yeah. you, did you, yeah. Oh, well, and to the question about 
comparing GPU and yeah. CPU performance. I mean, one way to do that is to normalize everything in terms of the capabilities of the hardware you're running on. So we shared a couple of those roof line plots during the presentations. But basically, you're looking at if, if a given kernel is memory bound, are you actually getting the performance you would expect based on the bandwidth? And if the kernel's compute bound, are you actually getting the performance you'd expect based on the peak uh, block rate that you're getting? So you can kind of look and see how you're doing uh, compared to what the hardware is capable of. This is one way to do it anyway. Yep. Okay. Um, let's now uh, take a 10 minute break, a 15 minute break. Um, and then we will be back with some more practical tips for running on Perlmutter and that might include some general takeaways for performance, even if you are not running on Perlmutter. And uh, finally, we'll move on to the hands-on exercises and more questions uh, if you have them. So see you all in uh, approximately 14 minutes now. Okay. Uh, pause the recording, yeah. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about certain Perlmutter specific things, but it may have some general takeaways for folks who are running on other systems uh, regarding performance or affinity settings that may that they may have to do, say, for GPU aware MPI and such things. So just to uh, set the stage, uh, if you for general information here, I'm, I'm assuming that everyone here is familiar with. Um, Slurm, the resource manager on Perlmutter, and uh, has uh, done some basic training regarding that. But you can go to Nurse documentation for more in general information. And recently, we did a new user training that we do, I think, every quarter or every... Three times a year. Three times a year. And, and so the re recent one was in February. And you can look at the slides and video recording from there uh here by going to the link but i'll now recap the parallelism strategy first for amrex uh Weechen and andrew both referred to it a couple of times uh, basically it is an mpi plus x strategy where the message passing interface is uh, used to distribute work and transfer data among the different processes for example in in this figure here the two square grids can be assigned to different MPI processes. Now for parallelism over CPUs, the grid is further divided into something that AMREX calls tiles. So here there is the blue tile and the orange tile as an example. And then each OpenMP thread can work in parallel on, uh, each, on um, each of those tiles or multiple such tiles. And of course, the OpenMP being a shared memory programming model can access uh, all the threads that are bound to a common process are able to access a common memory space, hence reducing the intranode communication cost. A lot of you might be familiar with uh, OpenMP and how it works, but still, uh, uh, you know, for the wider audience here, um, um, making that point. And this is an ex a scaling experiment done with the energy research and forecasting, or what we call the Earth code. It's an atmospheric boundary layer simulation tested over two Perlmutter compute nodes, so 256 physical cores. The problem size and number of cores is kept constant. And while we vary the balance of MPI processes and the open MP threads per process. So on the leftmost extreme, we use all like 256 MPI processes on each of the core. And as we go to the right, we keep increasing the open MP threads per process and reduce the balance of MPI processes. And you can see that for four to eight uh, open MP threads, uh, we see up to a 33% speed up uh, as compared to just using MPI on the left there. And uh, uh, so obviously th these things, the amount of speed up that you get or how many threads would be optimal depends highly on how you code your application, but uh, just showing how yeah, how, how, how much performance gain you can get by using OpenMP. Uh, and of course, as we use more number of threads, since this is a stencil code, the threads need to synchronize with each other um, frequently. 
And if you reuse too many threads, then that increases the synchronization cost and it's no longer beneficial there. Now, moving on to from C, oh, sorry. Uh, for Perlmutter specific information, here's briefly how you can use a hybrid MPI plus OpenMP job in via Slurm on Perlmutter. Uh, the important thing I think here is obviously you use, you can use an environment variable OMP num threads to, do, to prescribe the number of OpenMP threads. Um, and then the CPUs per task option in Slurm refers to the amount of logical CPU. So if you want at most one thread per physical core, you would set that CPUs per task option to at least twice the number of OpenMP threads that you want. So you need to make sure that you have asked for um, enough number of CPUs and things like that. But you don't have to remember all of this obviously right now. You can go to nurse documentation on hybrid uh, MPI OpenMP jobs and they, there are some example bad scripts there. Um, do, you, do you have anything to add on, on this? This is good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, moving on to GPU parallelism from CPUs, again, we have the MPI plus X strategy, as, as Richard mentioned, then at X here is the CUDA hip or sickle interface based on the vendor architecture. Uh, and this is set using the compile time option. Even for OpenMP, if you want to compile it, you have to enable that during the compile time. And here also uh, for GPUs, we, we do this at compile time. You mentioned that you want to activate a specific backend uh, for the GPU implementation. So each MPI process then assigns work to a single GPU and each GPU thread works on a single mesh cell. Um, and so make sure when you do the hands-on exercises, feel free to you know, uh, pay attention to your CPU versus GPU speed up and, and how that works. But we always like to run faster and this, um, the inter-process inter communication between the MPI processes is even more of a bottleneck uh, for GPU programs, just because GPU are able to do so much uh, work in parallel and uh, that communication, uh, you know, emerges as even more of a bottleneck with a lot of these traditional stencil codes. Uh, one option here is to use GPU aware MPI, which can directly communicate device buffers um, through the MPI calls. Uh, so if you use this option, use GPU aware MPI for your MRX application, it's a runtime option. It will allocate the MPI communication buffers on the device memory, on the GPU memory. So that in the MPI calls, the, the device buffer gets passed directly into the MPI calls. But that does not guarantee direct data transfer between GPUs. A direct, actually, the data being copied from one GPU to another directly may have more requirements in terms of the hardware or the firmware of the system that way you are running on. So I wanted to clarify some of those things here for Perlmutter users, um, but there might be takeaways for others too. So on Perlmutter, uh, the NVIDIA has the GPU direct technology, which does allow copying buffers from one GPU memory to another directly by passing the host as indicated here in the schematic. And then, you know, if you talk hardware wise, all four GPUs on a Perlmutter nodes are connected to each other using the NVLink interconnect, right? So if you are able to do the direct GPU to GPU uh, transfer, then that will improve performance. So what do you need to do to make, make, uh, make that work? So uh, first, a basic couple of things is that during compile time, you need to make sure that the correct uh, NVIDIA uh, compute architecture version is uh, uh, you know, enabled. And then at runtime, also you need to set this flag for MPEG uh, GPU support. Uh, these are actually set by default in the user's system uh, on Perlmutter. But you still need to be aware of this in case you are doing something in your, uh, in your environment that might disable uh, those things. But you do need to manually set the process GPU and network card affinities on 
Perlmutter in your job. Uh, this is not done by default. So the reason is that when you use, uh, so some of you may be aware that Slurm has inherently an option of doing uh, process GPU binding by using an option such as GPUs per task equals one, right? So that would assign or bind one GPU to an MPI process. But in that case, Slurm puts, puts each of the GPU in a different C groups, uh, in a different C group, and that breaks the CUDA IPC that enables this CUDA aware MPI. So you need to do the process uh, GPU binding manually. So as you can see here in this example batch script, uh, you mentioned the option GPU bind equals none. So that Slurm does not do any binding. And then if you see in the option below here, um, uh, you, you set the binding manually by using the CUDA visible devices option. And then you use the Slurm environment variable local ID uh, to do that binding. Another peculiarity that you might see here is this three minus Slurm local ID, right? So what is that? So as you know, each Perlmutter node has four GPUs. So what that does is that it binds the GPU zero to process three, the GPU one to process two, and so on. And the reason for that is that the GPU zero is actually the closest to the NUMA domain that is uh, with the processor three and so on. And that is the reason for this uh, kind of a binding. Another thing flag that you'll see here highlighted is the MPIT uh, NIC policy, which basically pins uh, the GPU to the closest network card. And so that closes this triangle of affinities between the process GPU and the network card. And that should give you kind of, uh, you know, the, you can say the optimal affinity here. Um, when you copy the files for the hands-on exercises, the instructions for which will be on the hands-on webpage that we'll, we'll provide soon. When you copy those files, there includes a folder there called GPU Aware MPI template, which has a template batch script, which you can modify as per your requirements. You'll need to modify the account uh, ID in there for yourself. Um, so this is not for you to try right now during the hands-on um, because, you know, to, to see an advantage from GPU aware MPI, you need that critical amount of communication that is that happens in a real application. Um, although with the CNS application, which I have that in that folder, you will be able to see an advantage, but it will it might be more effective for a real application. But coming to a real application, here's a scaling study with again the earth code, the atmospheric boundary layer simulation. Um, the blue line here shows the performance. So this is weak scaling, which basically means that as we increase the number of processes, we increase the problem size proportionately, right? So the blue line here is without the GPU aware MPI, and you can see a large jump in the wall time going from one GPU to two GPU to four GPUs, which is all within a node. And then it's this nice horizontal line from there on, with, which we would like for weak scaling. For the orange line here with GPU aware MPI, you see much less of a jump going from one to four GPUs, and then another jump going to multiple nodes. Uh, but overall at the multiple nodes, you see at least a 20% reduction in wall time um, going from GPU aware, not GPU aware MPI to GPU aware MPI. So uh, yeah, th these are some general takeaways for, these are some parameter specific things that you can um, consider, uh, I would say that when you are uh, just starting to develop an MREX based application, you probably shouldn't need to worry about these things. Um, I would say there are two cases where you would need to consider these things. Either you are actually running an MREX based application for production uh, simulations and things like that, and then this might be relevant for you. Or when you get to an advanced stage in your application development, when you want to look at performance more deeply, then you may want to consider these things. Um, but if you're just starting to develop an application, this may be uh, less relevant for you. Um, okay, so do you do any of the other instructors want to add anything or do we want to go to the hands-on examples? Uh, I think it's a good time for the hands-on examples. Okay. 
Um, there's yeah, just one more slide if you want to just move to the next one. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so it's time for the hands-on <laughs> portion of the training. Um, so there's three examples that are pre-compiled and available for you on the Perlmutter system. Um, the first one we call AMR 101. So this is using adaptive mesh refinement for scalar infection. So there's some mesh quantity. Uh, you can think of it as like the concentration of a dye or something like that. And then there's a predefined fluid velocity. And basically, the dye infects along with the fluid. Um, this example has dynamic adaptive mesh refinement. So you can see uh, how the grid structure changes as the dye gets deformed by the velocity field. And um, so in the, in the tutorial, there's going to be suggestions for different things you can play with in your inputs file. And you could also try comparing you're running the CPU version of this with the APU version of this and just see what the difference is, for example. Um, but it's the same source code just compiled for the two different <coughs> platforms. Um, AMR 102, this is an incompressible fluid pro flow problem. So it has a number of obstacles uh, that are embedded within a fluid. And then it's using a projection method to enforce the inc incompressibility. So it has a linear solve in there as well. And then this example also has a bunch of particles that are going to object, uh, infect around the obstacles. Um, and then finally, there's the AMRX EB Pachinko. So this is this is a fun one. So it's just like particles falling under gravity through an obstacle course, uh, bouncing off solid obstacles. So there's an example. This is basically an example of doing particle obstacle and particle wall collisions. And you can change the position of the particles and the obstacles by messing with the inputs files. So if you go to uh, this website that's linked from the slides, um, there will be detailed uh, kind of a walkthrough of basically how to run the different examples and like different things you can try.